Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, uh, whether you're here with us in person or joining us online. Uh, my name is Tatiana Bolton, and I'm the policy director for R Street's Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats Program. Uh, a little about us R Street is a nonpartisan, a nonprofit public policy research organization. Uh, our mission is to engage in public policy research and outreach to promote free markets and limited effective government. We're dedicated to building broad coalitions and working with a wide array of groups who share specific policy goals. Uh, which makes us uniquely capable of building support for pragmatic free market proposals that can earn bipartisan consensus. We're very excited to host you all today, along with our distinguished lineup of experts to talk about privacy legislation. The privacy of personal information is a national security and economic priority. Most here understand that passing federal legislation would result in a myriad of benefits to the United States, from improved relations with international partners to consumer protection and improved business practices. Uh, but getting a law across the finish line requires coming to consensus over key issues. As our mission at R Street suggests, we have pragmatically approached this question and partnered with Harvard Belfer Center's Cyber Project, led by Lauren Zabrick, and my former colleague from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, Corey Simpson, to provide recommendations to the major roadblocks that are hindering legislative action. Our work aims to build on the uh, efforts of experts who came before us, including the Brookings Institution, Privacy for America, the Future of Privacy Forum, IAPP, and Duke Sanford School of Public Policy. We've worked with over 70 organizations in, across the private sector, consumer groups, congressional offices, and more. This work, uh, this work means that we know, more than most, how close we are to what has so far been unachievable, national privacy legislation. Because of this, we're excited about the building momentum around the legislation, and we're actively engaged to make it a reality. Without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome on, on stage Kent Walker, uh, Google's President of Global Affairs and Chief Legal Officer. Kent is Google's president. Uh, he joined Google in 2006 and today oversees the company's engagement with governments across the world, content policies, and philanthropic efforts. Kent is an expert on data security and privacy and has been an advocate for both as he's worked alongside countries worldwide. So Kent, uh, please. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, R Street, for hosting all of us today. Thanks to all of you for, for coming. It's a pleasure to be with you. Information data is all around us. Americans sometimes take it for granted, but we all benefit from information services that we increasingly use every day. As I was coming here, I was making a list of the various information services that I used just in coming from my home in California to be in DC today. I booked a reservation on an airline using credit card information, address, name that I had stored in advance. I used a ride hailing application uh, to get to the airport. And in doing that, used that they, they had recorded my home and work address, making it easier for me to, to know, for them to know where to find me. On the way, we ran into traffic and I was able to check in using Google Maps to figure out what our estimated time would be and where traffic was on the route, a collective benefit that comes from all the drivers sharing aggregated data information, a little bit of their personal location to benefit all of us in terms of improved traffic flow and, and avoiding traffic jams. When I got to the airport, I was able to go through TSA pre-check, saving time because I had stored my credentials with them in advance. And when I was on the plane, I was able to actually shop online, purchasing something using an electronic shopping cart. So while we take those services for granted, they do have significant benefits that we encounter every day in terms of convenience, ease of use, making things possible that might not have been possible a generation ago. Now, even as Americans have gone through a two year plus pandemic and come to take up more and more of these tech services, they've also come to realize that they're not only great opportunities, but also privacy challenges that come along with that. And that's what gathers us here today. People recognize that there are concerns about potential misuse of that data. They may have even heard about the shadowy world of privacy uh, data brokers, uh, data brokers who 
buy and sell information in ways that people may not fully understand to actors they may not know about for purposes they may not approve. And I think people also have a greater appreciation for the need for consistent rules across the country, not a patchwork of 50 different inconsistent state laws, but a consistent set of frameworks that people can understand and rely on in a consistent way as we all go about our daily lives and that businesses can use to build consistent frameworks and know how to, to work together in a seamless way. There is clearly a range of views when it comes to technology, technology regulation. But when it comes to national privacy regulation, there is a clear message that we're getting from the American people. Americans want a national privacy law. A Pew Research poll showed that 75% 75% of Americans endorsed regulation of consumer data and data practices. But in the absence of a federal law, you're st seeing states rush in to fill the vacuum, understandably, but in the course of doing so, we're starting to see a patchwork quilt of various different approaches. And I don't believe anybody believes that the best way to regulate privacy in the United States is through a series of, of individual rules rather than a consistent framework. It, right now, there's a feeling that people are counting on us, all of us, to step up and address this issue and to do it fast. The, the good news is that after many years of, of discussion and debate, there seems to be a growing consensus on this need. As Tatiana said in her opening remarks, we are starting to see interest on both parties from many different constituencies and coming together on how to do this well. President Biden in his State of the Union address talked about the importance of getting privacy right. Congress is making progress, members of both parties coming together, House and Senate on various proposals. We have supported this direction travel for some years now. And so we think this is a very welcome development and we're committed to doing what we can to, to help move it forward. The challenge is that, you know, as we go into this new digital economy, um, the lack of a privacy law sets back not just any company or not just individual interests, but the whole digital ecosystem. And we need to have the potential of, that we need to be able to build trust in order to get to the next generation of innovation and new, new uh, uses of information, new, new uses of data that will benefit all of us. And let me be clear, uh, we at Google get this as well. Uh, we have increasingly adapted our products, our services, our approaches to improve the way our products handle data, to protect privacy and to protect security. For example, because digital services should keep your information for only as long as it's helpful to you, we introduced auto delete controls that let you easily delete your location history, your web history, your YouTube history. Try to do that with any other business that's storing information about you. We were the first platform to make it easy for people to download or transfer personal data uh, so that they could use it on other services. And today we keep more people safe than any other company in the world, because if it's not secure, it's not private. But to set new standards for responsible data use, we have to go further. And that's why we've pushed forward on new generations of privacy preserving and privacy enhancing technologies, using technological means to improve the state of play for the handling of information uh, across our services. Privacy preserving technologies aren't just privacy by design, they're privacy through innovation. They, they actually help minimize the collection of data. They reduce the risk of data being misused. And they do all of that without undermining the tremendous value that people get from information services. So for example, uh, at the start of COVID, we entered into an unprecedented partnership with Apple uh, to build exposure notification tools. We recognized to do that, we really needed to have privacy as a North Star. So we worked with government regulators, privacy advocates, public health authorities, 
And we did what we do best. We used advanced technology to build in privacy into the core of the notification app. And as a result, we saw uptick of that app, which ultimately saved thousands of lives around the world. Now, we're in a complex business and we haven't always gotten everything right. We continue to learn from those experiences and we know what's possible when private industry can work collect, co collaboratively together with the government to raise the, the benchmark for everyone. Of course, it's not enough for some organizations, some companies to behave responsibly when it comes to privacy. And that's why we need a clear and consistent framework across the country that governs all the different kinds of businesses that are increasingly using digital tools. So how do we do that? What's the, what's the best path forward? We're not focused on pie in the sky proposals like creating an entirely new agency to regulate all the different uses of digital technology that we're seeing across the economy. We, we're not looking for snappy sound bites. We, we want sound solutions. This is a, a big problem and we need to actually make progress with, with what's in front of us. The reality of all companies becoming digital companies, each with a potential to use technologies in, in different ways, really means that regulation of privacy, regulation of information is gonna require work across government agencies and across companies with consistent rules that benefit the economy and the country. Instead of focusing on theoretical applications or long-term improvements, we think we have something knocking on the door. We have Congress for the first time in many years coming to very close to being able to pass and adopt something. And we wanna support the work that's being done by Congress. There are legislative proposals right now that set out a framework by which this could be done. Senators Cantwell, Senator, Senator Wicker have outlined proposals with significant substantive areas of agreement on the issues that really matter to people. We hope they'll work together with Chairman Pallone, ranking member McMorris Rogers, to expedite the work through the committee process. We can also build on the work that's being done with regard to the privacy preserving technologies we talked about. Senators Cortez Masto and Senator Fisher, Representatives Stevens and Gonzalez have proposed bills that actually promote work in these areas. With the right leadership from the White House and from Congress, we can get there this year. So what are the sticking points? What are the, what are the barriers to getting what I think we all agree would be the, uh, a, a important new step for the country? Issues like how and when people can file suit, the scope and nature of FTC rulemaking, the question of how federal and state laws will work together. These are debated every time the federal government regulates business, including in the context of prior privacy laws. But they've been resolved in these prior contexts. These procedural issues can, are, have the potential for resolution in ways that we can draw on a rich background of other kinds of, of examples that are out there. And we think this, this too is an opportunity to try and move forward uh, in, a, in a sensible and a thoughtful way. There are responsible and reasonable compromises on the table. And so you know, with the right spirit, this work is already happening. These conversations are already going on. Now, of course, it may be that there are a range of uh, possible views when it comes to you know, what the standard should be and exactly how we should finesse it. But there's talk about, you know, on the one hand, the idea of notice and consent. On the other hand, the ideas of duty of care or duty of loyalty. One possible finesse to that would be a responsible data approach that increasingly would apply across the board to the growing range of our digital economy. For example, we could start by giving consumers reasonable baseline assurances around transparency, control, and similar issues. And we could then build on that by requiring responsible data practices. 
like privacy reviews and data minimization that could be easy to implement by a wide variety of companies and would improve the processes that governments, that businesses and organizations use to develop new products and services. Establishing those new norms around good, pro, de, uh, good development practices for privacy could improve privacy for everyone. But the time to act on this is now. Uh, the US privacy law would align us all on assurances that give people what they want, promote confidence in digital economy. It would rekindle US leadership in an area where we risk falling behind as other countries come up with their own privacy frameworks. And it would give everybody working in the world of information you found clarity and consistency so that organizations would spend less time trying to navigate inconsistent rules and more time preventing harm and innovating in new ways to protect information. That's the kind of work that leads to research break breakthroughs and encourages a stronger US economy. There's no question that getting this across the line is gonna require com uh, compromise. Compromise from different factions in Congress, compromise from privacy advocates, compromise from the business community, including Google, who are going to have to change business practices to align with these new norms. But that's what's gonna be required to get this done. Whatever final legislative uh, draft comes out of the negotiations, it's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna address every issue, but we believe that, we, that the worst thing we could do right now is to make the perfect the enemy of the good or the enemy of better consumer protections for Americans. So in closing, let me, let me just say this. Google is a, our heart an engineering company. We see problems and we wanna try and fix them. When we see big problems, we declare an all hands on deck moment where we pull people, engineers off of other projects and we rally to, to address the, the urgent issue of the moment. Well, this is that all hands on deck moment for, for privacy. The vast majority of Americans want progress here. We know that broad-based bipartisan consensus is almost at hand. It's a moment for Congress to come together in a bipartisan way and deliver for the American people. So legislation, and as it moves forward, legislators and regulators face important challenges and have an important opportunity. We pledge our support for that process. And we hope that a broad-based coalition of like-minded stakeholders will join together to support their work. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for those remarks. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, now I'm pleased to welcome Margaret Harding McGill, who is a technology reporter for Axios, uh, where she covers politics and policy of technology. She's gonna be moderating today's fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and for joining on the live stream. Now we have a limited amount of time, so I'm gonna try and just Lightning round some questions, Kent. Um, you talked about a responsible data approach, and I'm curious if you could give us a few more details about how that would actually work in practice. What would people's experience be online if this approach that you've proposed is, is adopted? What would change for people? The focus on responsible data practices is, goes, goes to the heart of how we are building products. It's something that we at Google have experimented with with regard to privacy design documents so that privacy is being considered in the earliest stages of product creation. It minimizes inadvertent gathering of information. It reduces the likelihood of over collection of data. It's a, it's a form of encouraging data minimization uh, where we can. We're using new tools like uh, differential privacy and federated learning to reduce the amount of information that's being gathered. So the goal would be for people to have the same services or better services that they have now, but requiring the use of less data to get there. So, that, I mean, that sounds nice. Why aren't we doing that already? Why do we need a law to make that happen? <laughs> many companies already are in different ways. The problem is many aren't. Uh, and having that as a benchmark, as a, as a norm, as I talked about it in my remarks, 
I think would actually raise the level of privacy protection, reduce the likelihood of information in the aggregate being gathered and misused. I think when we look at our experience online after uh, Europe's GDPR, the biggest change that people have probably seen is those pop-ups that you have to click on to get rid of. I, I guess what I'm wondering is if what are the privacy rights that people should have and how do you get a more effective change than just accept or deny? Yeah, so there, there's already a lot of talk in Congress the, about notions of being able to access your information, being able to uh, delete incorrect information, being able to transfer information, our, our data portability project. If you're using Gmail and you think you'd rather use a, a different email uh, process or service, you wanna be able to extract your information and upload it to, to that rival service. So these kinds of things, I think could go a long way toward giving people a sense of, of control of their digital environment. You mentioned in your speech, um, the auto delete yeah. uh, function that Google offers. Now, is that a default? Uh, my data is automatically being deleted or is that something I have to check to turn on? It, it is, on, so let, let's take a service like location history. It's, it's off by default. If you turn on location history, then we will hold on to your information by eight, for 18 months by default. So it covers you know, a, a year, which most people find kind of useful to be able to look back. You can adjust that, you can change that either way. Um, and so giving people the ability to control those, and if they don't take any action, we will still delete their data after 18 months. Seems to be the right balance there. Why, I guess, why 18 months? Uh, as you can imagine, we went back and forth about different periods. People wanted more than a year, but we're worried about you know significantly more than a year. So 18 months was a reasonable compromise that basically met the needs of most people who were interested in location history. Okay. I know the, of the things that you, you propose, Google is already doing a lot of these things already. And so one thing that I wonder, especially in the antitrust context that we find ourselves in so often these days, um, what would you say to criticism that if these proposals were adopted, it would just entrench Google's position and competitors might have a harder time uh, catching up to Google? I, I would say in many ways, the uh, companies will have the hardest time with a fragmented privacy landscape across the United States with 50 different laws would be smaller companies. Uh, larger companies have the ability to invest the engineering and build whole new architectures to uh, deal with, with conflicting laws. For a smaller company, a, a few engineers in a garage, that's much harder. So in many ways, clear and consistent rules, a, a common market for, for privacy and information uh, would actually be a significant benefit for the smaller companies. And increasingly at, at Google, we're trying to do more and more with less and less. Our, our engineers, our AI computer scientists are trying to figure out exactly how we can provide great services while minimizing the amount of data that we're gathering. You, did, you mentioned the, um, the privacy uh, preserving technology and its use in the COVID exposure notification. What are some of the applications for that technology beyond the, the COVID exposure? Are there other um, projects that you're working on that would use that technology? There, there, uh, there's a lot of research going on right now in these areas. I, I mentioned quickly uh, things like uh, on the privacy side, uh, federated learning, which basically means that your information never leaves your cell phone, doesn't have to go up to the cloud in any, any significant way, any person identifiable way, uh, or differential privacy that adds noise into privacy databases to make it harder to uh, de-anonymize information that's, that's coming back in. But there's also work going on on the security side, which is an important part of privacy. Things like uh, zero trust computing, where every node has to authenticate itself to confirm who you are, or defense in depth, where there's not just one wall you have to get over, but a series to keep your information safe. Okay, these are things that are uh, being researched right now, but are not necessarily in practice, or are you? No, some, okay. some of them are in the field now. So you, we've pushed uh, you know, multi-factor authentication, for example, which is a form of zero trust uh, computing for many years. Uh, and some of these other tools are already being used. On the, um, I wanna go back to, you mentioned state laws and the patchwork. Um, I, I, I totally understand that point, and it's one that I've heard a lot. But at the same time, uh, groups affiliated with Google, like TechNet or the State Privacy and Security Coalition, have also been pushing privacy proposals in the states um, that some critics say, hey, these are, are weaker laws than what we want. So how do you, I guess, address that tension between we want a federal law, but at the same time, we're working with organizations that are pushing these state laws yeah. everywhere. So as the states have been progressing, and we now have a number of states that have considered privacy laws, if they are going to legislate, we would encourage them to legislate in consistent ways uh, so that there is a, at least a framework to, to draw on. So a lot of the work has been done in that direction to try and establish 
state by state uh, templates and consistent approaches. But the far better approach would be for the federal government to come in and, and establish an umbrella that, that applies to everybody. I mean, given where things are with Congress, do you think it's more likely that you're going to get 50 perhaps consistent state laws before you get a federal privacy law? It's, it's, it's always hard to handicap, but we are more encouraged now than we have ever been before. Uh, the degree of interest, the positive signs, the bills that have been introduced on both sides of the aisle, both, uh, both sides of the Capitol, you know, there's an energy around this. And people recognize that with the GDPR moving forward, with the administration talking about cross-border privacy regulations, uh, there's a real energy here. It's, it's time in our growing digital economy for us to also be a leader in digital privacy regulation. What do you think, and this, and this side of the Atlantic, what do you think the White House needs to do on privacy. I'm not, I, I, well, maybe there's things that the White House has been doing that we ha we don't know about. And if so, I'd love to hear about them from you. But if not, what does what should the White House be doing on privacy that we haven't seen yet? Well, I think the first thing is, that obviously, the, the White House will, will do as it thinks best. But I think it's already set a constructive note by having President Biden flag this as a priority in the State of the Union. And that's a signal, I think, to, to everybody that this is a, an area of focus. We'd encourage them to keep working with both houses and the leaders in Congress who are moving this forward, and that's going in a good direction. But internationally, being a voice for consistent approaches, interoperable, interoperable approaches to help avoid fragmenting the internet, creating the balkanization of the internet, I think is a very positive role. Uh, Europe is just moving ahead so quickly on tech policy and uh, legislation. Uh, far faster than the US. I want to ask first, uh, there's two laws or regulations, the DMA and the DSA. I want to ask on the DMA first, how that might affect privacy it, or does it have an impact on privacy? I've heard some concerns that some of the rules about data sharing might actually hurt privacy in an attempt to help competitors. Yeah, this is an important area and there is a real uh, tension uh, that we all are going to need to reconcile between the desire to hold information close, which may benefit privacy and security, and share information broadly, which may help competition. Trying to figure out you know, how we get the various regulators around the table and thinking about the, those things in a holistic way is, is an important challenge. Uh, the UK has set a great example in a recent review that the communication, sorry, the Competition and Markets Authority did uh, together with the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, to analyze a project we had to help deprecate third-party cookies balancing privacy considerations, competition considerations, and coming up with a, a reasonable balance that work for, for their democracy. And we think that that's a, a template for how all of us can be thinking about this going forward. Okay, well, I know we could talk about this for a lot longer, but it looks like we're almost out of time. I'm gonna squeeze in one last question. Since I asked about the DMA, it's only fair to ask about the DSA, which made news over the weekend. Um, I wanted to ask what you, what you think of that, and also more specifically, if it's going to be challenging for Google to comply with some of these new rules. So the, for those of you who may not have been following all of this, the DMA is mostly focused on uh, competitive practices, while the DSA is more focused on content moderation and regulation. And there is some um, uh, rules around targeted advertising as yes. well. So that's what I'm... And, and there's some interesting overlap. So the rules on targeted advertising, the, uh, the DSA uh, prohibits targeting of ads to kids, targeting ads to uh, certain groups. These are practices we already uh, endorse and, and uh, use in our practice, in our services. So I don't anticipate dramatic changes there, but it's, it's a very long piece of legislation. It literally, the ink is, is not yet dry. They had a marathon negotiation session late last week. So we're still looking through the details. We hope that directionally it will align with the work we've been doing to improve the quality of content, raise up authoritative and, and reliable content on our services, uh, reduce misleading and problematic content. But it's, it's always a fine balance and we're looking forward to talking with the regulators about that. All right, thank you so much, Ken. I appreciate that we both talked fast to get through as many questions as go. possible. <laughs> and I know we have a great panel coming All up, right. so I will turn it back over to Tatiana. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you both so much. Uh, really appreciate it. A very interesting discussion, if uh, albeit fast. Um, we're going to take a brief uh, break to set up for the panel, if you all will uh, bear with us for just a couple minutes, and we'll get started.
All right. All right, everybody. Uh, we're back to our program and uh, moving right along to the panel discussion. I want to uh, thank everybody for joining us here today. Uh, I am pleased to introduce our uh, senior fellow and policy counsel for cybersecurity emerging threats here, uh, Brandon Pugh. He will be uh, leading and moderating the discussion. Uh, he focuses on obviously data security and data privacy. Uh, he also serves as an international law officer at the US Army Reserve and was previously the legislative counsel for the New Jersey uh, General Assembly Minority Office. So. So, uh, Brandon, take well, it away. Well, thank you, Tatiana. And it's great to be here. Good to see so many uh, friendly faces in the audience that care deeply about privacy and security. Uh, and specifically, three of those experts are on stage here. Uh, so just uh, start us, I'm gonna introduce them briefly. Um, and to my right, uh, your left, we have Nisha Mithal. Uh, she is a privacy and cybersecurity partner in the Washington DC office of Wilson, Sassini, Goodrich, and Rosati. Uh, prior to joining the firm in January, uh, she spent over a decade leading the FTC's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. In this capacity, she oversaw a team of 40 lawyers responsible for the enforcement of privacy and security laws and the development of policy positions in emerging areas such as artificial intelligence, biometrics, health privacy, children's privacy, among others. Um, next, we have Sarah Collins. Sarah is Senior Policy Counsel at Public Knowledge. Uh, specializing in data protection and consumer privacy. She currently serves as an advisory board member for the Future of Privacy Forum. Previously, Sarah was a policy counsel at the Future of Privacy Forum in the education youth privacy team, specializing in higher education and young adult issues. Uh, finally, uh, but certainly not least, uh, is Lartice Tiffith. Uh, Lartice is the executive vice president uh, for public policy at the Interactive Advertising Bureau, or IEB. He leads IEB's public policy team, which is responsible for advocating on behalf of IEB's member company on issues including consumer privacy and data security. Lart Lartice joined IEB from Amazon, where he led the company's public policy work on privacy, security, uh, and several other uh, topics. Um, so there's obviously a lot we could cover. Uh, we could speak, uh, really just do an entire panel just as a follow up to Kent Walker. Uh, but so we are going to start that way. Uh, then we'll transition to a couple substantive, uh, different substantive areas. And finally, we will end with uh, about 10 or 15 minutes for audience questions for those that are in the room with us. Um, so just uh, want to get your initial reaction as a follow up to some things that, that Kent talked about. Uh, we heard a lot, whether it be data brokers, responsible data processing, um, and, and just really the urgency and how close we are with legislation. So I want to get your initial take, and maybe uh, Manisha, if you can start us off on uh, what, your, what your thoughts were on and what he presented. Sure, thanks so much, Brandon. Um, uh, I thought that, uh, let me just pull on a couple of threads that Kent mentioned. I think the first you mentioned is data brokers. Um, I think we often talk about uh, privacy practices of platforms, and of course those are really important, but I also think it's important not to lose sight of the invisible numerous entities that are out there that are collecting consumers data uh, without their knowledge often. Uh, and so I think that was a really important point. Um, I think the responsible data use point was also a really interesting one. And I, I really like the focus on incentives um, because I think in order for Congress to craft uh, a privacy law, I think they need to think about what are companies incentives and how can we make sure that companies incentives align with consumers interests. And so I think just, you know, taking an I tend to think about these things in terms of examples. So taking an example of say a company that is collecting consumers data for security and authentication purposes, I think there will be for many companies, a real incentive to try to monetize that data and use it for other purposes. So how can we set rules of the road that, that kind of create guardrails around that data so that those uh, incentives are reduced uh, because of cost of non-compliance. So I, I thought that was a really interesting way to look at it and think about it. Sure. 
And Sarah, about yourself. Yeah, so I I want to also pull on the responsible data use because as a consumer advocate, one thing I like to point out is the problem with notice and choice. It assumes that the consumer that or the website users is, is in the same position as the all the different technologies that are backing that website, and they're just not. So if we can make a rule that incre- encourages compliance, encourages responsible data use from the company outset, rather than trying to push that burden on co- to consumers, that's what I would rather see. Um, one thing I do have to plug, though, is that we are big proponents of a digital regulator. Uh, you may have heard at IAPP, Microsoft talking about the possibility of a broader scale digital regulator. And if you have not read it, my colleague uh, Harold Feld wrote an entire book making the case for a digital regulator that talks about privacy and competition and other consumer protection issues. And that's how we look at tech laws here. We try to take a holistic approach on the ecosystem. We think privacy is really foundational there. And when you say, uh, and Lortice, not the Skip you, but when you say digital regulator, do you, do you envision it being more of an FTC role, a separate agency? We we out? have pushed for a separate agency now in the context of a privacy law that would hopefully get proposed and maybe even passed this year. Um, we know that's not realistic. You do not stand up an agency in under a year. But as a longer term goal of like regulating an entire ecosystem, we think that's the path forward. Sure. And how about yourself, Lordy? Yeah, I I I I have to say I uh, agree with Kent's um, comments like in, entirely. Um, I think the points that it really stood out to me is the need for us to have a federal privacy law because of a few reasons. One is, um, you know, we're one of the few developed countries that don't have one, um, and I think that in order to reflect that we share the same common values as our colleagues who are in Europe and and uh, and, and elsewhere around the world, we need one. Um, so I think it's very important from an international perspective to have to have to have one here. The other one is, is you know, uh, uh, to have a one national standard is deeply, deeply important. Um, right now, like I, I can't think of a, a subject matter that isn't more under the purview of Congress than interstate commerce uh, and which is in the Constitution. But also uh, the idea that, you know, uh, the Internet is 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 everywhere. Right, it's not limited to to borders, uh, and so we need to have one standard, one uh, set of laws. It shouldn't matter where you live in California, Utah, uh, Virginia, or Colorado. You should have the same basic uh, privacy rights and uh, as, as anywhere, anywhere, in anywhere else. Um, and then thirdly, I think as we sort of see these sort of patchwork, that, this is very, very problematic. And I want to kind of echo uh, uh, really the impact it has on small businesses. Right, who do not have the resources of big companies um, um, to, you know, such as, you know, uh, um, you know, some of our members uh, and others to uh, hire a bunch of lawyers to deal with these very complicated rules, uh, and and that is very problematic. I mean, uh, if you're a small, uh, medium-sized business and you're looking at investing more money, you know, into your products and services and delivering and reaching customers, you rather do that rather than spending time on hiring more lawyers to deal with ever complicating regulations. So I think that we really need this for, for our the next set of Amazons and Googles of the world to, to exist. And I think it's very important that we make sure we consider that when we're developing uh, a framework in our, in, our, in our future law. Sure. So mm-hmm. I, I know, Sarah, you had mentioned one pot- potential issue. C- curious to see if Nisha or Lortiz have it. Is there anything you s- see slightly different? Not necessarily disagree with, but something you would maybe say differently. Uh, Well, maybe I can kind of react to this idea of a digital regulator. I think there's a lot of appeal to having a digital regulator, um, particularly globally, um, where, you know, you have these international conferences of data protection authorities and the United States doesn't have a data protection authority. Um, I think on the flip side, though, I think one of the downsides of having a new regulator is that you have an agency like the FTC that has expertise already in privacy, in competition, in advertising, in fintech and other areas. And so I think that when we think about privacy as kind of a a siloed area, I don't know that it um, necessarily makes sense without kind of some of these other disciplines um, included in that. So I think there's some pros and cons to having um, a single digital regulator. Anything, uh, Laura, to add on? Yeah, I I think, um, you know, I uh, would disagree with my my colleague here uh, (laughs) about an independent uh, regulator. I actually think the Federal Trade Commission does a is, is the, the right agency uh, and expertise. I think they need more resources. Um, you know, if you compare the FTC to other data protection authority, they're, they're very under-resourced. So I think instead of us 
whole, standing up a whole new data protection authority. I think instead, let's invest that money in the FTC, give them some rule, some limited rulemaking authority. Let's give them a lot more staff and a lot more money and let them be the cop on the beat. And that's where I sort of think it, we should be heading rather than trying to stand up a whole new organization. Sure. So. And, and not, not to put you in the spot, but maybe maybe I will. Uh, have you given any thought to maybe the, the appropriate size and scope of the FTC? And what I mean by that is, you know, we've seen some people say we shouldn't expand the FTC, but the opposite is maybe we should double the current FTC size and everything in between. I know our street throws around uh, in, in our initial proposals, like maybe 500 million, 500 people over five years, looking at Lauren, because she's our FTC expert <laughs> uh, from Harvard <laughs> Belford Center. Uh, have, you, have you given any thought to maybe the appropriate staffing? Uh, that sounds about right. I mean, I think you can easily do a comparison, right? I mean, I think that right now that that number sounds about right. I definitely think it's in, in the, order, the magnitude of order of like hundred more staff and, you know, you know, maybe close to a billion dollars um, in additional funding. Uh, so that they can have the resources to actually go and enforce the new law. Um, and I think that's the way we go. And, and another component I would add in, uh, again, which is why we should not have an independent regulator, is that I think we should have state AG enforcement, right? I think that is another uh, component that would allow for, uh, you know, the right, um, the right uh, enforcement levels uh, across the country. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and just one more question to kind of touch on what Kenneth said. We don't often hear about privacy enhancing and privacy preserving technologies. Yeah, you know, we hear about it in an academic setting. At IPP, there's great conferences on it, but it, you don't hear a lot of it at the congressional level. Um, so have you, have you seen anything uh, you know, with that? Um, obviously, uh, Kent pointed out bills that were encouraging privacy preserving technologies. I think the reason you don't tend to see it, though, is privacy preserving technologies are really important for industry. And I am fully on board with industry figuring out ways to make their tech more privacy protective. I would hope that a law is much more normative than that. We're changing behaviors. We're changing incentives. Different tech doesn't necessarily change that. So that may be why privacy preserving technologies aren't really considered a focal point of a privacy law. Interesting. Yeah, and I, I think at the same time, I think I agree with that, but I also think that um, when Congress is thinking about enacting a privacy law, I think they should think about incentives for, for creating these privacy enhancing technologies. So an example is if you treat every type of personal data the same, you're not creating as many incentives for collecting less sensitive data or, um, or, you know, or, um, or you know, instead of collecting social security numbers, for example, collecting something that, that you know, you might not collecting social security numbers and collecting other data, or maybe creating incentives to just um, you know, have persistent identifiers instead of keeping names, addresses, contact information, things like that. So I do think there's plenty of things that Congress can do to incentivize privacy enhancing technologies without calling it here's the incentive for privacy enhancing technologies. Exactly, and that's a, you raise a great point because so many times we have privacy enhancing technologies and the definition and actual name of them is not consistent uh, across the board. And if your time at the FTC, was that a discussion point? Did that, that come up to the extent you, you can share? Yeah, no, it came up in a lot of different contexts. So, um, you know, when we were uh, drafting the 2012 privacy report, we talked about uh, creating a privacy framework with incentives for de-identification for collecting less sensitive data, for data minimization. Um, in, uh, in the revisions to the COPPA rule, for example, um, we said that there would be special rules if you only collected persistent identifiers and didn't collect other information about children. I think that created an incentive to, for companies to, for example, not collect geolocation data when it came to, um, it came to kids related apps. So I think things like that are really important. Right. Yeah, and we see the federal government now taking more of a, a proactive approach, especially with DHS now, but considering uh, you know expanding there. Um, so I, I want to move on to, to discuss the duty of loyalty and duty, duty of care. We we see examples of those in existing legislation, especially with Senator Cantwell. Uh, she has a duty of loyalty. Um, you know, we also hear a duty of care, but the distinct the distinction between the two is not always clear. Even even among those in Congress and academics, like disagree on the terminology. So. I was hoping, Lartish, you could just maybe tell us briefly, what is the distinction between the two? Yeah, so duty of loyalty is essentially that you will, that if you're, you know, if you're discharging your duty, you're not going to do anything that would be like conflicting. So you're not going to do anything that's self-serving. You're not going to do, so it's like ethical, like a really serious ethical consideration, right? When you're discharging your duty. And when I think of, when, when you think of care, it's about doing what's in the best interest. And, and, and for the good of the, the one you, you're sort of assuming that duty for. And so there's different, there's like a loyalty aspect, not self-dealing. And then there's a care, meaning I wanna make sure I'm doing the best job possible to serve you, 
right? Uh, and so, it, and, and these these are very common in like the medical profession. This is very common these distinctions in and uh, in, in the legal profession uh, and others where you have uh, um, people who are providing advice. And you want to make sure that they're not offering advice that where they have a, a, a conflict because, you know, I'm going to advise you make a deal because on the back end, I'm going to get something from it. Uh, or where people are making decisions that are not at their, their highest level of competence, right? You know, uh, you know, this is why, you know, malpractice insurance is very important, things like that, because when people discharge their duties, we got to make sure that they're doing it at the, at the highest level. There's a certain uh, courts look at this and, and ascribe a very high level of responsibility. So there's there's a care and a loyalty piece. And I agree with you that there's a, a lot of uh, interchanging and uh, conversation uh, around privacy about this topic. And I think that's part of the concern uh, about, you know, sort of bringing something that's not really meant for the privacy uh, area uh, and then all of a sudden graphing it on. And I think that is a, a real concern with this whole idea. So. Yes, and expand on that. Like I knew Neil Richards and Woody Hartzog have done a ton of work in this space. And even in one of their papers, they acknowledge a critique is that a duty of loyalty is ambiguous. People aren't sure what that actually means. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, Sarah, if you've, if you've given any thought to that, like, what could it look like? No, I, I definitely agree with that. And I, I heard uh, professors Hartog and Richards talking about this, and I was a skeptic around duty of loyalty because of the ambiguity. But the thing that duty of loyalty or duty of care could give a privacy law is if you, if a privacy law does not confer broad rulemaking authority to whatever regula federal regulatory body is enforcing it, that means you're not going to have fine-grained rules about a variety of different practices. Congress cannot foresee what's going to happen. So I could see the appeal of a duty of loyalty or duty of care to provide plaintiffs with flexibility to allege harms and to do the back and forth process to see if that practice did violate some norms that feel violative. You, When you give a company your data, you expect them not to exploit it. And I think that's just a general consumer protection. And that is a way to sort of codify that feeling without having to explicate it for every single practice that could go forward. That was a great point. And I guess Manisha too, for reflecting your FTC time, if there was a duty of loyalty, would that be hard to enforce? Because I almost feel like some of it would be subjective. Yeah, no, I, I think that's why you kind of need a layer of rules under it. So it might be a, a useful umbrella concept, but I do think that the devil's in the details. So, you know, when I think back about, um, you know, how people have conceptualized privacy, I think there's been two main models. The first is kind of a more consumer rights type model, consumer autonomy, consumers get to choose, they make choices, notice, consent, et cetera. Then I think there's been, a sh there was a shift to more, a more accountability type model um, where um, we talked about, you know, documentation, hiring of a chief privacy officer, a data protection officer, um, and having a more kind of accountability data stewardship type model. Um, and I think what duty of loyalty and duty of care add is, um, so I think of duty of care as more analogous to the negligence type standard. Um, don't, you know, uh, don't do harm to consumers, not a reasonably avoidable, uh, uh, not kind of uh, outweighed by benefits to society. Um, and I think of duty of loyalty as having a more fiduciary, you know, uh, don't self deal uh, things like that. But I do think that all of these are just different umbrellas. And I think the, you know, when you get into the rights, okay, so do no harm, um, make sure that the incentives of the um, business are aligned with the interests of the consumer. Um, I, I think these are the types of things that will be more rules-based and, uh, and, and, and agencies like the FTC should have the ability in, to enforce those ground level rules. Great, and really a question for any, any of you or, or all of you. Um, do you think the rules and the duty should vary based on the, the entity size? So like, should we treat a very large company differently than maybe a, a two or three person uh, company? And then as follow up to that, should the type of data they have you know, impact that? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and that's been a fundamental tenant of all the privacy laws, all the um, data security laws that, um, that have been in existence. That we, In the data security field, uh, regulators have always talked about the level of security commensurate with the sensitivity of data and commensurate with the size and complexity of networks. Um, and so I think that same concept would apply both, um, you know, amount of data collected by a company will affect the, uh, the privacy uh, uh, protections that should be afforded to that data, um, as well as the sensitivity of that data. And I think, um, you know, I think one of the concerns on the sensitivity side is that if everything is deemed sensitive, 
what is the incentive to collect less sensitive data? I feel like I'm a broken record to uh, continue to talk about incentives, but I think that's, that's a really important aspect of what any privacy law should look like. Can I just build on what you Please. what you've been saying? I think that's a really great conceptual model, but you'll notice it's a variety of factors, right? It's not just like small businesses get one rule and large businesses get another because small businesses could have a very set of harmful data or using harmful data practices that we find um, unacceptable. So this sort of balance of what kind of data, what processing, how large, whom does it affect is it, it's like a multi-part test, right? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And I think, I actually think even more than size of the company, it depends on the amount of the data, amount and sensitivity of the data that is the way I would phrase it. So for example, in the recent revisions to the FTC's GLB safeguards rule, the, the safeguards were not keyed off the size of the entity, it was keyed off of the number of records that the entity had. So you could have a really small company with a lot of sensitive data about consumers. And I think that the rules should be keyed off to the amount and sensitivity more than the size of the company. What are, yeah. what are your thoughts on Yeah, that? I agree. I think that it, you know, um, when it comes, it's, we should take a risk-based approach, right? And small companies can have tons of biometric information about people, which uh, to me is like the riskiest data to have because we're, we're all, the, the, there's a, a possibility of there being a data breach or some kind. And, and if you're a small company, you don't have the right controls, but you're all of a sudden given an exemption, that that's a, sort of creates a disincentive to actually invest in having the right security um, in place. So I think when it comes to this sort of type of data, I think it's very important. So if, if, if you have sensitive data, which I agree with you about not making everything sensitive, uh, but there are, I think biometric is what we would all sort of agree is, is sensitive data. Uh, and so it shouldn't matter whether you're small, if you're a one person shop or a billion person shop, you should have the same uh, rules and obligation. Um, I think when we start talking about non-sensitive data is where I sort of, I full of, kind of move away from that a little bit. Because you know, if we're talking about like you know what I had for lunch today, um, or what I'm going to have later, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't I don't consider that really sensitive information. And so, small companies who are in, innovating uh, in these spaces that are not dealing with biometric information, I want to give them the, the ability to sort of do that. Again, I talked about this earlier. You know, they that you know I, I don't want them investing in more and more compliance, right? Um, and I think that if you are dealing with uh, what I would consider nonsense of the data, I think there should be sort of a carve out so that small businesses don't have the same uh, compliance burdens as the bigger companies do, right? Um, you, know, you know, big companies, uh, they can hire thousands of lawyers and thousands of privacy engineers in order to comply with laws. Uh, small companies can. And, you know, we don't want to create burdens uh, and, and make it harder for people to to uh, to enter markets and this goes into a kind of a competition area um, and you would in, in putting a uh, putting certain restrictions on small businesses would actually kind of entrench the dominance of bigger companies so established companies. sure and yeah. did you agree I guess with Kent uh, in his his I guess the fireside that that is the benefit of actually a federal law. It actually would help small businesses then it would absolutely I agree with him I mean you know I think you know uh, a lot of people don't realize that small businesses you know, rely on the internet to a greater extent than, than anyone else. Um, we, we actually released a study recently uh, uh, talking about this. And, you know, it's something where, you know, we have tens of millions of jobs are relying on internet. And there are a lot of creators, and entrepreneurs, we've seen it, uh, what the internet is today, what digital is today. And uh, that's all because the internet has been a neutral platform that anybody can get in and get involved. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we don't for, you know, close it off from people uh, and we keep letting it allowing to thrive. And so I think this is very important that when we sort of think about crafting rules, that we're sort of thinking about how to make things simpler. And I, and I think that's why one standard matters because again, you know, if we're going to have, a, if we have a 50 state patchwork, that's terrible, absolutely terrible for, for small businesses and entrepreneurs and creators. Sure. So just transitioning it slightly, but, but connected obviously with to notice and consent. I know Margaret brought that up in the fireside chat. Do, do we think a duty of loyalty would solve the traditional notice and consent uh, model? Uh, and are there other alternatives to that that could potentially be a solution? I mean, I, I can start. In, in a way, it's, 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 you know, we've talked a lot at these conferences about, you know, how notice and choice is terrible. And I kind of view notice and choice like um, how I view hand washing during the pandemic. You know, it's, it's, it may be kind of important. It's, it's something that everybody should be doing. But there are other things like masking and social distancing and testing um, that are going to be more important. So I think um, I think that's where that is where things like duty of loyalty come in, focusing on the uh, interests of the consumer, fo fo focusing on avoiding harm to consumer. I think also looking at harm expansively. 
So I think there's there was a time when people said, okay, well, if it causes physical harm or financial harm, that's cognizable and that's something the FTC can go after. And I think that's a really limited way to look at harm. Um, and I think some of the bills that I've seen that include a duty of loyalty um, have included something like if, if a practice is highly offensive to a reasonable consumer, that would be considered a harm. Um, and I think those are the types of things that we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at chilling effects on free speech. We need to be looking at um, you know, uh, uh, reputational harms and things like that. And so I think, I think that's where a duty of loyalty can be helpful um, in order to kind of help us think more expansively about the harms that we need to address through a privacy law. Uh, another thing that could be beneficial is also just stating outright permissible purposes. One of the reasons I don't particularly like notice and choice or notice and consent is because a lot of times I have to consent to things that I would allow anyway, like uh, allowing my number, to, allowing you to know that I am on this website and saving a cookie so I can more easily shop. Like there are plenty of things that are routine that we can say right now. And we either put it in law or regulation. That's just like, you can do this company. Don't worry about it. Just keep on keeping on. Sure. And that that's beneficial. It's beneficial to consumers. And I think it would be beneficial to companies as well. But again, having consent be a mechanism, duty of loyalty, duty of care, permissible purposes, you're building like a multifaceted way of looking at it to hopefully take the best bits of all of these different things and building a law that works for consumers. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that, I, I think if I, if I didn't, didn't make it clear earlier, I think this duty of loyalty, duty of care is a very vague, ambiguous thing. And I think it would just end up just being not very helpful to consumers or to businesses or anyone. I think that there are already, we already, we're very, uh, a lot of our um, protections for consumers are already built around consumer protection laws, right? There's already, you know, UDAP laws and, and things like that. I think there's already, you know, uh, ways and frameworks that we can use uh, to build on. I believe in responsible use for data. Um, and, you know, our organization uh, joined with other organizations to put forth a, a Privacy for America uh, framework, a framework around uh, responsible use. And where there is sort of a um, per se reasonableness, um, depending on certain action you take. And then there's an unreasonableness, right, depending on what it is. And you have to, uh, you know, like for, for like just going back to uh, one example, and I think one that uh, Ken, Kent brought up earlier is like, if I um, um, am a, uh, a, a, a transport company, I need to have your location to be able to serve you. That is something I think is entirely reasonable, right? I think consumers expect that. It doesn't surprise consumers that, you know, for, for me to get picked up, someone needs to know where I am. Same thing about getting your packages delivered, right? If you want a package delivered, I got to know your location. So I think there's like some things where consumers' expectations are are very clear. And that those sort of practices by those companies are, are, are what we consider per se reasonable, right? Um, and then there are other things that are probably a little less so, right? And 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 and, and those are things we want to sort of prevent. We want to we want to make it easier for consumers to understand how their data is being used, but in a way that is informative and actually helpful. And I think that these ideas and notions of let's create a duty of loyalty, duty of care, I just think just gonna just add up, um, um, not really help, being very helpful. I, I guess I would, all, I, I would say that I almost feel like this is new terminology. It's kind of like old wine in a new bottle um, because a lot of the bills I've seen, it's like duty of, you know, section blah, blah, duty of loyalty. And it has a lot of these same concepts, permissible purposes, impermissible purposes, data minimization. And so I think that, um, you know, I think these are new terms. I think they embody a lot of the things that we care about, like, you know, responsible use um, and other things. And I think this is um, partially just a, a new terminology, a new kind of packaging, so to speak. That's a good point. And so I guess connected to that, though, do we think the GDPR gets this right? Like. I know they've thought of a way to, to potentially get at this and, and, and use a lawful basis model. Is, is that a good approach? Is that something U.S. should consider in, in our privacy legislation? I think it's very similar to concepts we already have in U.S. law. So the, federal, uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act um, has the permissible uh, uses, the lawful bases. Um, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act has this list of um, you know, permissible uh, uses of persistent identifiers. And so, uh, again, I think these are all different, slightly different ways of, of threading the needle. Um, but I think it's I, I do think that these are important concepts that any federal law should be borrowing from. Great. Yeah. And I think if I may, the sure. GDPR, I think we should also realize is still fairly new law we're still learning the benefits and costs associated with it. So it's only been, it's not even been 
four full years yet. So, I mean, I think that it's great that you're achieved it and, and passed it, but we're still learning from it. So I think before we decide, you know, should we take that and use it in the US, I think we should probably study a little bit more. I think also there's already some innovation going on here. I think of, um, you know, uh, there's already been a couple uh, people who put together uh, bills that are really good. Um, you know, like Virginia, I think law is really good um, that we can sort of look at um, and consider building on. Um, but anyway, I just want to say before we sort of decide if we're going to take the GDPR concepts and bring them here, I think we should probably study a little bit more first. So do you have any thoughts on GDPR? Uh I think I think GDPR could provide a useful framework. I don't think it needs to be the U.S. framework. Um, one thing I will say, though, since you brought up Virginia, I have a very different opinion of Virginia and Utah's laws. I'm not really sure what extra compliance they add for uh, businesses looking at it, especially Utah's. So I, I would say that kind of model is not something I would be looking forward to and seeing. I, it does need to be more substantive than that and substantive protections. Um, but I, I agree with Manisha of a lot of the concepts in GDPR are concepts we are seeing. And while they not, may not borrow exactly the same language or put in place exactly the same way, this language of data protection is migrating back and forth. I also think that, um... I think it's important to keep in mind what what are the problems we're trying to solve for and you know that we don't like in existing frameworks. I mean, I think the consumer rights based model we, we're worried okay that's going to put too much of the onus on consumers. Companies should themselves be responsible data stewards. I think the concern about kind of the accountability data protection officer approach is that some people say oh this is mere kind of paperwork and um, you know internal uh, governance issues and um, and not really getting at the problem. And so I think that as as Congress is crafting legislation, I think it needs to keep those things in mind and make sure that kind of they're not just adding burdensome paperwork requirements. They're not just kind of putting more of the onus on consumers to make uh, more decisions that you know consumers who are already busy and um, and 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 involved in many things. And, and making that connection is is a good segue because especially when it comes to enforcement, we hear of like, we shouldn't just have enforcement for the sake of enforcement. We should be tying enforcement to address a particular harm. And connected that we've heard arbitration come up a lot, uh, you know, fairly in, in recent time. Just curious, to, I want to explore that. Um, how does arbitration connect in a, a data privacy context? And what are your personal thoughts on that? Like in terms of, like, we know the default now is most companies favor an arbitration approach instead of a litigation approach. You want to start us off? Yeah, I'll, I'll start that one. I mean, so this whole idea of arbitration is coming about because as we sort of think about how do we get a federal privacy law done, the two sticking points that have the major sticking points have been around the idea of a preemption, which means essentially that the federal law were preempting states and states wouldn't be able to introduce uh, new laws and regulation around data privacy. The other one is around um, a private right of action, meaning what is consumers' uh, ability to access courts to sue uh, for any privacy, perceived privacy harms uh, alleged. And so those are sort of the two big sticking points you have on one side, uh, Republicans favoring very much supporting preemption. And on the other side, Democrats really favoring PRAs, uh, private right of action. And so uh, in order to sort of figure out how do you wedge, how do you, you know, find a middle ground between the two, one concept that's been coming up is an arbitration. Um, possibility, right? We're meaning that, yeah, uh, you you allow uh, consumers to be able to um, arbitrate claims, um, and you know, arbitration generally has been found to be less costly and and more quickly resolving disputes than going to court. Our courts are already jammed um, with lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, claims, and so. You know, opening it up to uh, more suits uh, is not really going to really be helpful to consumers overall versus an arbitration, which 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 possibly would. So that's sort of the sort of general uh, idea about having arbitration instead of uh, not having it or having any uh, PRA. Uh, so, I mean, whether or not to have an arbitration and a consumer protection law or allowing it is not a new concern for privacy, right? Um, this context happens a lot. Like public knowledge has supported Representative Johnson's FAIR Act, which would ban these sorts of clauses. And while I think at public knowledge, we would welcome seeing that, we do realize this is the balancing act of how do you create your private right of action? What preemption are you doing? Those like sort of procedural protections of which arbitration banning it could be part of or could not be is one of the ways you sort of craft a uh, smart private right of action. I think that I think that this goes to the issue of trying to find compromises on you know private right of action. Um, 
I guess my personal view, I think arbitration and pre-dispute binding arbitration clauses are so fraught. Um, and there's been so much, you know, in the financial services sector and in other sections, I'm just concerned that kind of adding this issue is going to create yet another barrier to getting this done. I think there's some other compromises on private right of action, um, things like, you know, uh, harm requirements, um, scienter requirements, you know, limitations on damages. I think those may be um, more promising than kind of inserting this, this issue that is uh, so controversial. And we've heard some critique that arbitration potentially could hurt consumers in the fact that like people do not realize that they're consenting to arbitration instead of litigation. Is there a way maybe, is there a middle ground there in terms of how can we improve it so consumers maybe have better notice, uh, maybe targeting the arbitrators themselves to ensure there's more experienced arbitrators having a you know a varied pool. Have you given any thoughts to that? Yeah, I mean, I think arbitration can be helpful. Again, we're trying to find a middle ground and there has, there has to be compromise. And we, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And that is part of the problem. And that's part of the quagmire right now in, in government in general is that everyone wants it to be perfect on their side or their view, and you have to compromise. Um, look, I, I, you know, I prefer that there, I don't really think that we need a PRA, to be honest with you. I think that, like, as I mentioned earlier, let's give the FTC a lot more resources uh, and rulemaking authority uh, limited, and as well as that the state AGs enforce. And I think that consumers will be better served than having something that allows um, for a, pri a private right of action. However, I know I'm, I'm a pragmatic and I realize that if we do want a federal uh, uh, law passed, we gotta, we, we have to compromise on this issue. And this is sort of a, one way of, to do that. Um, I don't think um, arbitration is the only part of it. I think there's also uh, an idea around having a no, uh, having a cure provision, right? So if you say that I did something wrong, I get like 30 days, 40 days to fix it, right? Before you can sue me. Right. Uh, this actually we see this already in the uh, ADA cases, American Disability Act cases. Uh, California has a law like this and, and uh, that allows for a cure provision. There are so many other ways that we can look at how to create something uh, that it that is both um, helpful for consumers, but also not going to be overcomplicating and problematic from both. How do we enforce it um, and also how consumers can actually and businesses can actually comply with it. So. Sure. Yeah. And since Lartis brought it up, Sarah, curious to know your thoughts on, on the right to cure uh, uh, and, and in terms of like maybe with a time frame, we, or should we even have it at all? So my preference would be not to have it at all. But realizing that we have to be pragmatic, I think there are places where it might make sense if it's a first time violation, especially for something that is much more, um, let's say, procedural, like they didn't give you your records within 30 days and they get an extra 30 day extension to do that. If not, then maybe you bring suit to make them produce your records. That's less problematic for me. One thing, things that I would find problematic for right to cure is if we're talking about systemic violations, whether it's violations of people's civil rights, whether it's like internal governance questions about like not having correct notice of like transparency policies or whatever, those sort of systemic violations, it seems quite silly to have a 30 day cure for, for if your allegation is something like this process is violating my civil rights and is discriminating me based on race. Like it just doesn't seem to work there. I, I disagree. I think that if, if our goal is we want compliance with this new law, my, mind you, privacy is very, very, not, not a very easy thing to sort of discern. And for a while, we're going to have to have time for businesses and consumers to understand what this new law is. And before we start opening the floodgates to courts, we should first give their time and, and mechanism to allow for people to comply. If at the end of the day, there's an allegation that someone is violating someone's civil rights, privacy related, obviously, there are already civil rights laws that protect um, uh, consumers and, and, and people in, in, uh, in general, but just related to privacy, uh, I think there should be an opportunity to cure it. Say, look, I didn't realize that this algorithm was doing that. Let me let me look at my algorithm, test it and make some changes. Right. If, if the goal, again, at the end of the day, we want compliance. Right. We're not trying to um, just be punitive. But that doesn't redress the harm that happened. Generally speaking, if a if someone's coming to you, it's because they've been harmed by something. And that's why I, I'm skeptical of cures that are going again to sort of those personalized harms, the, the not getting your records in time. The harm there is quite minimal, but other allegations, the harm is really serious. And I think that's, again, how you have to key things off of is the harm that's happening 
to the person. Well, this is also why I said that the agency should be really the ones looking at this, right? This is again where if there is, there's an investigation, right, by the FTC or the state AG and they look into this. Uh, they're the ones who can determine if there was a, if there really was a violation. Again, these are a, a lot of lawsuits are based on allegations and sometimes there's a misunderstanding of how things actually work. Um, you know, uh, and so I think that before we subject you know, our courts and companies and small businesses, especially who are going to be more subjected to these suits, we should make sure that we do it in a way that's going to be very careful. Uh, I'm not saying that we can't, sorry. No, 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 I'll it's stop fine. There. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> that's right. that's hey, I think I, we have the industry and the consumer advocate next to each other. No, no, no. <laughs> maybe the balance is out. We go to the show. <laughs> so I actually hope the drafters are listening to this conversation because I think there's been a lot of interesting ideas here about how to bridge gaps. So we've talked about harm. We've talked about right to cure. Um, I, I talked about scienter. So again, if you look at the Fair Credit Reporting Act, for example, there's different levels of private rights of action for willful compliance versus negligent noncompliance. And so I think you can throw all these things into the mix. There's um, agency enforcement, um, which maybe is not subject to any of these thresholds. Um, and so I think that there's ways to bring all these ideas together and really try to you know, further the goals of compromise and trying to get something done at the federal level. And Sarah and Lortiz both brought up civil rights. I want to give you an opportunity to expand on that too. How does that look in privacy legislation? Is that something that should be in text or is that something that an agency should maybe rule make on? Um, I do think it's important for privacy legislation to address um, civil rights concerns. Because when I think about data collection, I, the, the two you know, big harms that I think about that may not always be addressed under current law um, one is using data for making eligibility decisions, you know, populating decisions about health care, employment, um, insurance, things like that. I think that's one harm um, that's mentioned a lot. And I think that any legislation needs to address. And I think the other harm is discrimination, um, you know, digital redlining um, and other things. And so I think that, you know, the idea of, um, of, of serving an ad in and of itself um, may not be problematic, but to the extent that advertising is be used to determine eligibility or to discriminate against certain populations, I think that's where it's really important. Those are the types of harms that privacy legislation should be addressing. And if I may jump in, because I want to make be clear about what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a notice, procure, and cure provision in terms of people being able to bring something. I absolutely support civil rights, uh, and I don't do, do not, um, uh, and not, neither do our members believe in bias or any any sort of that. I think that those things should be accounted for uh, in a law um, because I think it's sort of expected. Um, I think that uh, to the extent that there are any um, gaps between the civil rights law and, and as it applies to technology, we should fill those gaps. So that means that like an algorithm um, should not be able to do anything that a person can do. So if a, if a person couldn't discriminate based on race, uh, an algorithm shouldn't be able to do. So I want to be very clear about that. What we were talking about earlier, though, is this idea about a cure provision that allow people to correct any potential issues. And that's um, before a private right of action. Before, before, before a private right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And not a cabin on what FTC or yeah. what the agencies can do. So, so, so yeah. uh, no, that, and that's, that's a helpful clarification. Uh, just a final question for me before we go to audience questions. Uh, so be thinking of your questions and Sophia will, uh, will bring you a mic. But everything we talked about so far is important. And the consensus came up as a reoccurring theme and being responsible for data use. How do we move forward? Um, and it's a twofold question. Do you see where we are now being different than in the past? And how do we actually make a privacy bill? Hopefully this year, um, what do we need to do? So I know it's a, it's a, <laughs> a loaded question. <laughs> Whoever wants to start. Go ahead. Um, so I think we're feeling a moment for it because there has been so much talk about tech accountability generally. And I... I think a lot of the harms that people are concerned about with, with tech tech companies comes from data use, even if it isn't in a traditional privacy sense. And one thing that brings accountability without necessarily getting into thorny questions of content moderation, or should we amend section 230 or other things is like, well, first, maybe we should have some rules about how data is being used. And I think that's why there's hopefully this urgency around it. I would love to see that happen. I mean, I'm all for locking the four um, chairs and rankings of commerce into a room <laughs> and make them, you know, figure it out and they can't leave until they have something, if that's what we got to do. But I, I think that's why you're feeling it is there is this impulse that something needs to be done about what what's happening with tech and it's coming from all sides, competition, content moderation, everything. 
Well, I feel very optimistic still that we can get something done because we've been able to do it in many other cases. There are many other issues where laws have been able to pass. Um, good laws take time, though. So I think we also need to realize that. Um, I think the work that our street is doing by trying to find the middle ground is excellent. And we didn't pay you for this conversation. You did not. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not paid by our street. But it's not, it's not just our street. It's also the Brookings Institution. I think there are a number of other um, think tanks and organizations who are looking at finding the middle ground because it's what we need. Right. Um, and so I, I do feel like we could get it done. I'm also very uh, I'm very I'm encouraged by uh, President Biden uh, and uh, Secretary Raimondo, uh, them making privacy uh, a, a national uh, president agenda. Uh, and I would love for, for them to, to sort of lead the way. And I know they are um, doing some of that. I know that the uh, NTIA has done some some roundtables around looking at private addressing privacy. Um, I think that work can, can continue. Um, I agree with what you said earlier. <laughs> let's let's put you know Kentwell and Wicker, Senators Kentwell and Wicker, and others in a room and say you can't leave until you get this done. <laughs> I think that would also help. So yeah, I feel really good about. It. Hey, what are your thoughts, Manisha? I hate to be the skeptic in the room, um, <laughs> but uh, you know I you know been in this area for a long time, and um, you know when California passed the first breach notification law. We were like, yes, now you know Congress is going to get to work and 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 pass a, a breach notification law. When there were massive data breaches, we said, now Congress is going to get to work and pass a data security law. Um, privacy Shield was invalidated the first time. Um, <laughs> we said, um, uh, we said, you know, now Congress is going to pass a law. So, so, so I guess you know, with with the state laws coming on board, with this groundswell of support, with consumers saying they support it, with if you look, and I think uh, Kent alluded to this, is that if you look at the Wicker and Cantwell bills, substantively, they're very similar. So it's just a shocking amount of consensus. And it would be a real shame if we couldn't get it over the finish line. I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> No, and we, you know, at Archer, we agree with the need to to push this forward. And I think that really underscores the point of having these conversations and continuing the emphasis so Congress hears like there is a need for this among, you know, consumers and industry and advocates. Uh, so we want to, go, want to go to audience questions now. I, we have 10, 10 and 15 minutes or so. Uh, and Sophia will bring it. We want to limit comments uh, and questions rather to what you've heard in the panel so far. Um, so if you have any, any follow up questions, it'd be helpful. Uh, hello, uh, Dave Prayer from uh, Amlex. This is a question for the gentleman from the IAB. Do you use a ad blocker on your browser? And if you don't, what are the most recent advertisements you've received? <laughs> I'm not sure that was covered during our earlier <laughs> area, but I will indulge uh, for the moment. Uh, I don't use an ad blocker. I love advertisement. I love personal advertising because you know what happens is that I get asked that are actually suitable for me. Um, you know, I think people need to realize when you opt out of ads, you're not opting out of ads, you're opting out of personal ads, so you're getting less relevant ads to you. And I don't need, I don't want um, ads around whether I should get certain toothpaste or not, if I prefer to be looking at something else, like, a, you know, whatever it may be. So I, I'm, I'm all for it. So, uh, but I'll, I'll stop there. What, what, what are the ads you've received? Oh my God. Um, uh, Let's see, I just talked about, <laughs> uh, I think I have uh, for my daughter, who's very obsessed with Greek mythology, <laughs> been looking at um, doing something with her on uh, that. We're gonna potentially travel to Athens. So I've been getting ads, I think a little bit related to, uh, to that. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, pulling this together because I actually don't usually see ads. They're usually, you know, not what I'm sort of staring at. But um, anyway, I'll stop. There. No, sure. Yeah, sure. Any, any other questions to you? Yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't, I didn't. Go ahead, Sophia. Hi, um, I have two questions. One is, if you look at all the data regulators on the face of the planet, which one do you think is the best one? And my other question is, well, out of all the regulators that you have seen so far, um, the second one is, if you could make it a bit personal, <clears throat> you may have children or you may have nieces and nephews, or when you yourself go to these different websites, how do you feel? What goes through your mind, whether it be about uh, settings related to cookies or when you go to Facebook, you know, by default, they want to grab so much information and you have to go to each and every section to make deselections. So kind of how do you feel? Do you feel anxious? 
do you feel like I can't trust these websites? So if you could share your thoughts, I would appreciate that. Manisha or Sarah, do you have a, do you have a preference? Uh... Um, I don't know that I have a favorite DPA. That's a new one for me. And I think I'll have to think on that. Um, I, I, what you think you're getting at is like sort of the privacy controls that have been offered. And for me, there is a bit of a sense of frustration, right? I'm a relatively literate, tech literate person who's trying their best. And oftentimes I get very frustrated trying to figure out how to set my settings so that the, the, the website like Facebook or whatever works optimally for me, but is also as privacy protective as possible. And I don't think I'm the only one that has felt this frustration. Uh, so that that's the overall feeling I guess I have when dealing with privacy controls. Yeah, and so I would say, so I mean, in terms of regulators, I was at the FTC for 22 years. I thought the FTC did a great job with enforcement with the limited tools that it had. Um, I think there's other agencies that are doing a terrific job, um, particularly now with enforcement of GDPR uh, and other things. Um, for me as a consumer, um, I guess uh, my issue is habituation. I mean, we already talked about some of these pop-ups and the, you know, accept and the, you know, do, do not allow tracking, do allow tracking. And so sometimes I just, I have to admit, even as a sophisticated tech user, I just click through, click through, click through. And so for me as a consumer, I just want to know that there is a law that prohibits companies from doing certain things with my data. And that would make me feel a lot better. Um, and so that's why I think that a law should be enacted. Hi, on our panel, we have um, a lawyer from a law firm that represents Google on privacy issues. And we have a representative, a trade association of which Google is a prominent member. And I'm curious from those two panelists, where do you think Google's Kent Walker has gotten it wrong? Yeah, I, I know we touched on some of that earlier. Is, do you have any follow-up points from what we, the, kind of the, anything you disagree with or? And if you don't have anything to add on, I know we did, we did kind of dive into it earlier. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, anything that I think Kent said, I don't really disagree with. Um, and I, you know, I think it was very sensible. Um, I, I think people should also realize, like, businesses realize that there is a change in a sea of privacy among consumer protection and consumer expectations. And so companies are already implementing a lot of the things that people are, are because they want to keep their customers. And, and we realize that like uh, consumers now, uh, they want transparency. They want to understand how these things are being served to them. And you see a lot more of those things being developed. Uh, I mean, if you go on uh, different websites, you now will get uh, something, an explanation for why you're receiving that ad, right? And if you decide they're doing it because of something I don't want them to do, they'll, they'll switch, you can switch it off. So consumer, customers are, I mean, uh, companies are already doing that. I think also Kent had brought up differential privacy which is, an, I think, another thing that's sort of booming. Like, look, we're trying to uh, get give people data minimization. And part of that is having less data that actually goes to the cloud, doing more on-device processing. Uh, you know, you talked about federating learning, uh, differential privacy. All these concepts are already being implemented by companies. Uh, so I think that you're already seeing some of these things being done. Uh, and so for, for a lot of the uh, companies, uh, you know, they're, you know, they support, Privacy. I mean, I think that's uh, I think that's sort of uh, the people uh, people don't realize that they're that the the, the, the sea has changed on privacy for businesses, and we're, it's already being being done, addressed. And to be fair, do you do you have a quick thought, Manisha? Yeah, I, I thought the Kent's comments were very um, you know uh, uh, general in the sense that like I don't know that there would be any disagreement with concepts like data minimization, responsible data use. I thought that um, um, I thought they were very kind of. Um, current in terms of what the debates are. And so, so I don't have any disagreement. Great. We have time for maybe one or two more questions too. So we'll try to go to the right side after this too. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Florida got pretty close a couple months ago to passing a comprehensive um, data privacy law. And there they actually, for the first time we saw a state come to some sort of agreement as it relates to private right of action, providing tiers where they would allow a private right of action based off the how big the company was and how much revenue they generated. Given that this has been such a sticking point in federal legislation and even in other states over the past several years, I mean, could this be seen as a model going forward where we finally, particularly for what's a particularly conservative state legislature, the fact that they, that they, that they found agreement on it, is that something that you think could be replicated in other states and at the federal level? 
I'll, I'll jump in. I, I actually don't think so. Um, I don't think it should, I don't think it should be the model. If you look at it right now, we have four states with laws and only California allows for like data breach, right? So there isn't really a private, I mean, California is not a, is, is not a, a red state. Um, uh, in, in, you know, Virginia also, same thing. We have Colorado uh, and Utah. I think that the model right now, if you look at the four existing laws, is moving toward not having really a PRA. Um, Florida didn't pass this law, right? So there's a reason. Uh, I, I think that, you know, uh, you know, going back to being pragmatic, I think a PRA is going to be something we sort of have to take in order to get a federal privacy done. But if you look at right now, you know, the trend is not going that direction. It's going the other direction. Do a so. quick thought, sir, on that. Or, or I, just PR. Uh, oh, so the Florida model could be one. I don't think it's that great if you're trying to like incentivize. The the reason I think private right of actions are important is because one, your enforcers at the state and federal level are subject to the whims of their attorney generals and commissioners. And right now we have a sort of see a wave of people wanting to bring these suits for, for political reasons, for other reasons, but the next administration may not have that same urgency. So a private right of action is a backstop to non-enforcement by your government, but it's also there to push forward ideas that may not be palatable to those enforcers because they have to bring either cases they know they can win or politically important for them to win either because it's a point of law that's important or it's a political statement that they're making. Um, and this sort of tiering system based on size really doesn't get at that because what you'd hope for plaintiffs is when they've been harmed egregiously, if the state or the feds won't come in, they can at least vindicate their rights. So I, while it could be a model that Congress chooses to, I don't think it is because it doesn't really address the concerns of advocates who are, are pushing for a private right of action. We'll do one last question. question. Thank you. Um, before Christmas, I bought a big garbage can. After that, then everywhere I go, the garbage can keep on following me, every device. <laughs> I'm on. And it looked like they did a great job of tracking me, but also they protect the privacy very well because they didn't know I bought it already. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently, um, look like Google cannot differentiate what is a recurring purchase item, what is not recurring. Seems to me that's the problem because that it's keep on going on for a while around the new year time. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody have a, maybe a quick uh, reaction to that? Then... I just think retargeting is, is probably the most um, visible form of, of tracking. And I, and I do think that, um, um, I, I think there's you know, a lot of discussion about kind of opt out you know, and, and versus kind of universal systems, global privacy controls. Um, and I think that's a very much important part of the debate. I see we're getting low on time. Uh, I know Lauren has a, has a, a question uh, to kind of wrap us up here. Then we'll give each panelist a final thought or two. Thank you. So earlier we were talking about the size of the FTC and Lartis, you thought that the, you know, maybe growing to 500 and, and that sort of thing was a good size. And I would just love to hear, you know, from Manisha and Sarah, what your thoughts are on what the size of the FTC should be. Um, so, so I can start and I don't have the most recent numbers. But I know that when we were doing comparisons of this issue, the Irish DPA had, you know, 600 and the UK um, information commissioner's officer had uh, office had 800. And given the relative size of the US population, um, I think that, you know, the FTC could use hundreds more at the very least. A um, couple of caveats on that. You know, one is just from an organizational perspective, I think that needs to be kind of staggered. I think it's very difficult to you know, uh, start to add, you know, hundreds of people to an organization at the same time. Two is that I think the FTC needs to hire um, multidisciplinary people. So not just lawyers, not just investigators, technologists, um, and other kinds of, um, of, of disciplines. Um, and so, I, and, and, and third, I would say that, uh, you know, I think it's very important not just to get bodies, but also get to, to get the legal authority. Um, because if you have 100 people or 500 people or, you know, 1,000 people, if it's not illegal, um, if it doesn't violate the law, um, then, you know, the, it's going to be a problem. And so I think getting additional legal authority is just as important as getting new resources. 
So what are your thoughts, Sarah? Oh, um, we were supportive. I believe it was in the Build Back Better Act of the 500 million increase for the FTC. I mean, I'm going to defer to Manisha here as someone who has been working there, and I agree with all of her points. Um, if we're going to have the Federal Trade Commission as the country's data protection agency, it needs to be staffed that way. And like the 50 or so people at DPEP, like they're good, but they are not that good. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to give everybody a final thought. Uh, if you have, Lortis, if you want to start us off, anything final you'd like to say? Or Well, no, I just want to just thank our street again. Like, I, I think this has been a great day and conversation um, just to have this and, and bring more awareness to um, the desire to have a federal privacy law um, and the ways that we could potentially do that. Um, I think that, you know, this is what we need, sensible uh, compromises. I mean, that's how at the end of the day, we're going to get something done. And I'm just glad that, you know, we were able to sort of do this today to have this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I echo what Lartie says. I hope this portends a <laughs> privacy law. <laughs> um, well, just to counterbalance my previous skepticism with some optimism, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I hope Congress passes a law, um, but even in the absence of, of uh, you know, Congress passing a law, it doesn't, I, I think, I don't think we should all be waiting for Congress to pass a law. I think everybody should be doing their part. I think regulators should be doing more enforcement. I think companies should be looking at this issue as a way to build consumer trust. Um, and I think that, you know, states uh, should, you know, enforce their laws, continue to work, doing the work that they're doing as well. So, um, so I think everybody has a role and we shouldn't just wait for Congress to act though I'd love for Congress to act. No, and of course, thank you for the three of you. I know there's so much we could have covered in this panel. It's hard to narrow it down. Um, no, but thank you again. If you don't mind, just uh, join me in thanking our, our panelists. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brandon. And thank you so much, all the panelists for a great and spirited discussion. Um, we at R Street believe that events like these are key to moving the debate forward uh, because varied perspectives, even in disagreement, uh, are crucial to understanding and crafting an effective passable bill. Uh, as you can see, when you came in, uh, we had we have a one pager of our recommendations that are uh, soon going to be released in longer form. So we hope that you engage with us on any and all of those uh, topics as we uh, craft those recommendations. Um, we're excited to see progress on this legislation because we know that it has never been more important to get this done. So thank you all for joining us today and uh, have a great day.